Well, thanks for joining. This is uh, the Boston.net Architecture Group. And we're really pleased again for a second month uh, to have Alvin Ashcraft to join us and, and talk about another great topic. And uh, I'm just going to turn it over to you, Alvin. Thanks again. All right. Thanks, Robert. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Uh, my name's Alvin Ashcraft. Um, this month, I'm back talking about uh, WinUI 3 and Windows App SDK projects. Um, if you were here last month, uh, we looked at one of those WinUI 3 projects a little bit, but um, this time we'll spend the whole hour diving into different examples using uh, WinUI and Windows App SDK. So my uh, About Me slide here. Uh, if you don't know me, I've been in the software industry since uh, the mid-90s. Most of that time I spent as a, a developer and architect uh, using different Microsoft technologies. Started back in mid nineties with BB3, Microsoft Access Database. Uh, let's see. You may also know me from my blog, Morning Dew. Um, every working day I post a bunch of links that are, I think, relevant to .NET developers, web developers. I try to include some database and DevOps stuff. And uh, lately there's been a lot of AI news to share on there as well. And I also have uh, three different books from Hack Publishing. Uh, there's two editions of Learn WinUI 3. The first one came out when uh, Windows App SDK 1.0 and WinUI 3 were first released a few years ago. And then just um, a few months ago, the second edition came out, which uh, had a lot of updates. If you uh, pick up one of those editions, make sure it's the newer one. The first one, was built mostly with the, the preview bits because we released right when they did. And then the other book I have is about parallel programming, concurrency with uh, C Sharp and .NET. It was written with .NET 6, but pretty much everything in there worked just as well with .NET 8 today. And uh, let's see, a couple of years ago, actually tomorrow is my two year anniversary joining Microsoft as a content developer. I work on the Windows Developer Docs on Microsoft Learn, um, work on Windows App SDK stuff, uh, UWP still, do a little bit of maintenance here and there with those docs, uh, and some Win32 API documentation. I focus mostly on the um, like data access, file I.O., uh, security, cryptography, all those kinds of APIs when I'm working on the Win32 stuff. And finally, I'm one of the founding organizers of the Tech Bash Developer Conference. Uh, it's a conference that we host every year down at the Kalahari Resort in the Poconos. Um, you may know some of the other Kalahari conferences. There's Code Bash in Ohio. Uh, that conference has uh, Wisconsin and Texas events now at those Kalaharis. And uh, I think you guys are going to be getting the Kalahari in a few years up somewhere outside of Boston. That one's a few years down the road, though. I think the next one opening up is somewhere south of DC. Uh, a little more about Tech Bash, just some general info. It's at the Kalahari. It's right now still the, the largest indoor water park in the, the Northeast. Uh, we get great speakers every year. Last year we had uh, Scott Hunter, Mads Christensen, uh, Kathleen Dollard all came from Microsoft to do keynotes for us. Uh, we have a welcome reception game night on Thursdays where people bring their own uh, board games, card games. Um, it's family friendly that night. And we do family day sessions on Friday with uh, kids sessions. Uh, attendees can bring their kids for free to those. And uh, we have a great time all week. So the agenda for today. So we'll get a quick overview of uh, WinUI 3 and the uh, App SDK. Uh, we'll look at what it looks like to create a new WinUI 3 project from scratch in Visual Studio. We'll look at some of the uh, controls and styles. Uh, we'll get into some MVVM model view view model with uh, the open source MVVM toolkit. That's actually part of the uh, .NET community toolkit. And we'll, then we'll look at the uh, Windows community toolkit uh, controls. Uh, it's another open source toolkit with controls, behaviors, uh, other helper classes in there. And we'll look at uh, some of the notifications APIs in Windows App SDK. Those came out, uh, I think, early last year. So you can do both push notifications and app notifications. And we'll 
take a quick look at the difference between those two things. Um, some interop options. Uh, you may be familiar with some of the interop you can do between WinForms and WPF. Um, they recently released uh, XAML Islands for uh, WinUI 3. It's currently not really fit for everyone to use. Uh, you can only reliably use it with C++ code, and there's no interop with uh, WinForms and WPF yet. Hopefully that'll come down the road at some point. And the other way you can interop is using the, the web view control, so you can host some web content in your WinUI app. Uh, we'll take a look at some deployment options. Uh, we'll look at a cross-platform app demo with Uno platform. And we'll take a quick look at the WinUI 3 roadmap, what's going to be coming up later this year. All right, so just a quick overview of what's WinUI 3, what's Windows App SDK, uh, what's the difference. Uh, so WinUI 3 is actually a part of the Windows App SDK. It's probably the main thing that most people associate with the Windows App SDK, um, but it's got other APIs and capabilities in there that you can use from WinUI 3 apps. And you can also use a lot of those APIs from, from other Windows desktop apps as long as they're they're packaged apps, so packaged in an MS, MSI app, which can, gives them a identity within Windows to be able to access some of these APIs. So WinUI 3 uh, was first released in March 2021, along with uh, version 1.0 of Windows App SDK. So it came out, I think, about a week after the first edition of my book was published, and they changed namespace names and all kinds of stuff. <laughs> Uh, let's see, WinUI 3, uh, the C-sharp apps run on the .NET runtime. So today you can create a, a WinUI 3 app running on .NET 8. Uh, I know some developers are already starting to play with WinUI 3 running on some of the .NET 9 previews. So it doesn't work right out of the box with file on the project, but you can get those things to work. Uh, the most popular project type was a is a C sharp app with a XAML UI, uh, but you can also use C and XAML. And you could technically create most of your UI in pure C sharp, but you're still required to have a, a XAML file there for each screen that's either a, a page or a window control to host whatever UI you're building in your C sharp code. Uh, let's see, the latest release is Windows App SDK 1.5 uh, that came out just a few weeks ago. And if you attended my session last month, uh, we compared WinUI 3 to some of the other Windows development frameworks. Uh, you can also check out this link on the screen. It's also in the links that I'll share in my repo. Uh, but this compares all the different options for Windows and what's supported, what's not with each one of those. And uh, WinUI 3 is kind of open source. They've released the source, but it's not um, open for contributions or anything, but you can get the source and it can be helpful for uh, debugging purposes. Some of the errors that you used to get were a little convoluted and now you have the source to be able to tell what's what's going on when you run into issues. So the first couple of demos, we'll look at uh, creating a new WinUI 3 project. And then for the the second two demos, I'll be uh, using a, a project, I think from chapter five of, of my book. Uh, it's got some MVVM toolkit stuff integrated in there and also uh, some of the controls from, uh, we'll look at some of the controls that were used in that. So let's uh, get to my Visual Studio here. And we'll create a new project. So I've currently got my filters set to C sharp, Windows, and WinUI for the, the types so that we can see here. I've got 
template studio installed. That's an extension that you can use to uh, give you a, like a nice wizard style to get things started. It can give you NVDM support right from file new project, but we're going to start with a blank one. So here we want blank app package, WinUI 3 and desktop. It's a little bit wordy. Um, when they were in preview and version 1.0 came out, there was WinUI 3 and desktop and WinUI 3 and UWP were two different project types, but now there's only the desktop, which is uh, .NET under the covers. For the name, we'll just call it Austin Demo. And some of the .NET project types give you the option to select a version of .NET. You don't get that with the current templates for WinUI. I'm hoping that they'll add that at some point so you can select if you want you know, .NET 8 or 7 or the uh, preview, if you have previews installed. So here's what you get out of the box. You have uh, an app.daml which has a C-sharp code behind. This is the entry point for your app. And you'll see here the on-launched event happens, and then it creates a new instance of your main window and calls activate to bring that into focus. And if we look at the XAML for the, the window, it's just got single stack panel with the button inside there. It just says click me. It's got a click event that goes to the code behind. Click that, all it does is update the button to say clicked. Click on that. So when you run a, a WinUI app, it's not actually just building an EXE and running it like you would with WPF. So it's packaging the app, installing it into Windows, so you'll actually see it show up in your, your start menu once you debug for the first time. So here we've got the uh, single button that says click me, and it changes to clicked when you click that. And let me actually so you can see how WinUI is hooked right into all your Windows settings. If I change my theme to something with a light mode, it picks it up right away. So we can stop that. And I think if I bring this up, here's that, like I said, I put it right into the start menu. So this Boston demo app is now installed in Windows, and I can just Run it there. So the XAML in app.xaml is uh, you can put any resources that you want to share across the entire project in here. If you have some styles or some other shared uh, code that you want to use in all your forms, uh, you can put those right in here. Let's take a look at something with a little more meat to it so we can check out some of the controls and see how you integrate some MVVM. So this is from chapter five of the book. It's uh, an app that I built out throughout the chapters of the book called My Media Collection. And with this app, you can add different, um, you know, build your own little media collection, things that you have, books and uh, DVDs, if people still collect CDs, you can add those kinds of things in here too. If we open it up, you'll see that there's a main window, just like we had in the other project, but I also have two pages. So I implemented pages inside my window to uh, take advantage of navigation to make it easy to switch from page to page. 
So if we look at main window, it's got nothing in it at all. But if we look at the code behind that, also nothing at all. So let's look at apps and we'll see us. This is where all of that is being hooked up. So instead of just creating the instance of main window, we're also creating a root frame that'll be inside the window and calling this register components method that I created. And in here, we have a navigation service where you're setting up each of your pages. So adding those to the service, and then you're telling it to navigate to the main page when you kick off the app. And down in here, it's also doing a little dependency injection using the host container in .NET. I'm adding singletons for my navigation service for the data service that'll pull in the data from whatever source I'm using. Um, at this point, I don't remember if it's hard coded. Let's take a look at that. Yeah, chapter five, I think things were still, that's navigation, data service. Yeah, everything is just hard coded in this data service. Later in the book, I added a, yeah, an actual database, SQLite database. Now you'll see with WinUI 3, they don't have a visual designer yet. So we're gonna have to just look at some XAML here before we run it. Um, so we have a few different grids. We have a, an outer grid and then another grid that will be at the top of the, the screen where we have a button or text block for the media type and then the combo box where you select if it's you know uh, movies, books, music, and then a list of all the items in the collection. Let's take a look and let you just um, see the UI of this before we go back and look at some more of the, the layout. So here's that label, the drop down. You can say I want to see just books, everything. List view where I can select some items. If I have an item selected, I can hit this add edit and it'll bring up the details screen where I can edit the details for it. So, hey, I don't really have a hard cover, I've got a paperback. And then I've got a button here where it'll save and go back to the list, or I can hit the, uh, the drop down button and say, I want to stand this, I want to stand the screen and create a new item instead. So let's say, Big Shark, some generic movie. Got the Blu-ray for the Big Shark movie. And I can say it's in my collection or no, I've loaned it out to somebody. There, it's added it to the list. So in the side of the list view, I have a header template where I can define you know, the border, you saw that purple here at the bottom of it. And then I've got an item template for each of the rows. It'll create an instance of this grid. And I'm binding to the name and the media, medium info that name. So it's telling me, is it CD, Blu-ray, paperback, all those kinds of things. And at the bottom, I'm bottom here. I'm using a stack panel with a couple of buttons. I think later in the book it uses one of the controls from the community toolkit to do a drop down button instead of wrapping it in a stack panel. Let me stop this running. And so for each of the views, you saw the the data binding here. It's using X bind. It it also supports um, Binding expressions, but with the X bind, you get the compile time checking that all these bindings are valid. Let's look at the main view model. Uh, this is where it's using the uh, the MVVM toolkit. 
Looks like there's a tab open with that info here. And it's using source generators for, for the attributes that we'll look at in a second. So by creating a, a private field and then putting the observable property, you'll have code that you never have to see, but it's generated and it gives you the, the public property that you'll be using for the data binding. And it automatically calls this set property, which does all your property change notifications to notify the UI that something's changed and it needs to get the new value. So in here, I have a bunch of properties with that observable property set. So it's gonna be generating my public properties. So I've got some observable collections, which will notify the UI when items are added and removed. And on this select a media item, in addition to the observable property to create that public property, I've got this attribute notify can execute change for. So anytime I change the selected media item, so if I click an item on the list, it says, hey, this delete command needs to know when you're selecting an item so I can enable and disable my delete button. And the delete command is down here. And it's saying, hey, when I need to check that, I'm going to call can delete item. So it's checking if the selected media item is null or not to enable or disable that delete button. So let's run that again and just take a look at that. You can see that delete is disabled, but when I select an item that's no longer null. So the delete button is enabled and works and then disables again when there's no more items selected. So this saves you a lot of you know, extra typing. You don't have to have the public properties for all, all your data. You just have your privates and then decorate them from the, uh, the toolkit attributes. And the other thing to get that all to work with the attributes, you have to inherit from observable object from the toolkit. And you have to make your class a partial class so it can generate the other half of the class with all those hidden properties. Right. Let me get back to the slides here for a second. Any questions on this basic MVVM stuff? Does everybody have a pretty good grasp of model view view model? Have you used it with WPF or other frameworks? Yep, thumbs up. Sounds good. All right, so let's get back to here and jump to the next slide. So the Windows Community Toolkit. So it's a community toolkit. It, like the .NET Community Toolkit with that MVVM stuff, it's an open source project. Uh, it's got controls, helpers, animations, behaviors, and a lot more. Um, the source and the documentation are both stored in the GitHub repository. And then the documentation is surfaced on Microsoft Learn under the .NET docs. So we're going to do uh, explore the Toolkit Gallery app a little bit. And then we'll also take a look at uh, some code from chapter nine in the book that has the community toolkit controls added to it. Let's get back to the browser and community toolkit. So this is where their docs are. They've got all the controls and helpers all documented on Microsoft Learn here. And you can get to all the same information if you install the Windows Community Toolkit app. So this has got the animations. Let's select one of these controls. Let's look at the settings card.
you can you know, play with things a little bit in the, the UI here, turn is enabled on and off. Let's see, let's look at so rich suggested box. Um, so it's like an auto suggest box, but it also supports rich text. So they show you the syntax for each control. They've got some all the information from the documentation is surfaced here in the app. Show you some different examples. Radio gauge is another. You can play with some of the properties right here in the app. Change the text spacing. And then at the bottom here, you can see the little view code button. So it'll show you the current code based on what you've selected up here in the top. So as you change these, it'll change what's down here too. Ah, oh no, it's it's bound to these controls up here. So let's take a look at, let's close this Visual Studio and go to the project for the toolkit. So this app is a little bit different. So inside this one, it's using some different things from the toolkit. It's using this header content control, which gives you a little header at the top of your screen. Uh, it's got a drop shadow panel to give you some shadow effects. And then it has a, a data grid, which is in the toolkit. It's not completely supported yet, so um, got some quirks. Uh, the drop shadow stuff I had to, instead of using this, uh, there's an attached card shadow that works a little bit nicer. And the drop shadow panel, you can see those squiggly there, it's obsolete. So this eventually will not be available in the toolkit anymore, but it works the same as, as what the uh, new card shadow is gonna do. Let's launch that and take a look at what you get from this. So here's the uh, the header control, which just gives you some header text at the top. The grid view, you can see the drop shadow panels creating a little darker yellow shadow around the grid. And then this attached drop shadow that's in the grid resources is being used down here for this text. So it's saying use the common shadow up here this shadow effect. Right. Let's see, get back to the slides. Okay, so Windows App SDK and Notifications APIs. So in this demo, we'll look at what I did with uh, chapter eight in my book. So in this demo, I'm using the app notifications. So from the app, we're going to send a notification that'll pop up the little toasted windows. And in the toast that pops up, you can, it has a text box so you can type a reply and we'll have that come back into the app and show up in the status bar at the bottom. Let's 
All right, so this is pretty much the same app as what we saw before, but this one I believe has some real data hooked up. In the services, if we look, there's a SQLite data service now that's being used instead of the uh, hard-coded data in the data service. And we have some helpers added. Uh, there's Notification Manager, which handles you know, registering and unregistering for notifications, uh, processing things that come in. Notification shared. This is um, has some stuff required for uh, like messages, letting you know if the toast was sent or not. These are the messages that will pop up in the, the status bar. And then I have a class for each of the different types of toasts that we'll be creating. So we can create a toast with an avatar. And both of these use this app notification builder in the Windows app SDK. So you're adding things for um, setting the logo here, put the text on it, saying we're adding a button. And then the other one was the text. It's pretty similar. Let's just give this a run and we'll come back and look at the code in the buttons. So it's the same kind of app here, but we've got some real data coming from a database. And you'll see the, the look is a little bit different. I applied some of the, the newer Windows 11 uh, Mica styles. It gives it kind of a, a dynamic look. So I am going to click um, send notification with text. It's toast of sent. It may not popped up. No. Try that again. It may not have registered properly. This is to make sure my notifications aren't snoozed as well. Nope, not. All right, so we are going to take a look. Just to look at the text of my app manifest. There's a lot of configuration that needs to be set up here. So we've got you have GUIDs that need to be created to identify your app to Windows. I'm going to try just tweaking this and see if this causes it to re-register. All right, let's hit a break point and see what's going on. We get to do some live debugging. So step into that. application 
has an ID, so got sent to Windows. There's something that's probably not hooked right on the receiving end. Well, this one I should have recorded the video backup, but what it does is it pops up a notification with the text box, like I said, you can type a message and then in that status bar, it'll pop up the message that was returned. And this app notifications documentation, the quick start is pretty much what I did on the app here, the screenshot. What you can do here, you can have a text box, you can have uh, drop down control. This is pretty much the code that I used. Here's what it looks like when you put a little image on there. You can click that and open app. It'll bring your app back to the front when it receives a notification. Here's with the text box where you can type the reply, and that's what pops up in the app. The other type of notification I mentioned, I don't have a demo for it because it's even more involved, but there's a lot of Azure config that you have to do with this, the push notifications. You can follow along on here sometime if you'd like to play with it, but you would you know, register an app registration in uh, Azure AD. Same kind of setup for your that manifest. And then you can use uh, a tool like Postman or something to uh, call the API that will send a push notification down to your app to test it. Oops. Sorry about that demo. That's a tricky one. All right, so the interop stuff. So XAML Islands, uh, the control in Windows App SDK and WinUI is called Content Island. Um, there isn't a full featured post yet for WinUI 3 like you have with WPF and WinForms. Uh, the Content Islands uh, they, and the related controls that go with that, they were released in uh, 1.4 of Windows App SDK. Uh, but they're currently only recommended in the C++ WinUI projects. Um, there's no wrapper for using islands in your WinForms or WPF yet. I'm hoping that will come when they get the, the .NET and C-sharp version working. Um, you can check out the release notes that are linked on the screen here for more information about the current capabilities. Um, the other option for Interop right now is uh, using the WebView 2 control. Um, in chapter 12 of my book, I created and deployed a, a Blazor app, and I host that in a WinUI 3 client app. Uh, you could do the same thing with a PWA or any other web page. Um, the map control that was just released is actually a uh, custom WebView 2 control. Um, there's a, another option, too, that I don't have documented here, but I'll add a link to, um, to the links in my repo. Um, the .NET MAUI project has a Blazor hybrid web view that will let you um, take a, a Blazor project and it's hosted locally in your project instead of out on the web. And I found a, a blog post where somebody got that to work with the WinUI 3 app. So you could have the Blazor uh, components in the same project as your WinUI app. And that's all running locally. That way you can potentially share some local resources and maybe run some of the, that Blazor functionality offline. Uh, so let's take a look at that, the WebView 2 Blazor demo from chapter 12. Close this one down. Blazor WebView. So this one has two projects. Um, we can take a quick look at the Blazor 
project. This one I already have running up in the cloud though, so I won't run this one. So I don't know how many of you have worked with Blazor at all, but when you start a new project, you kind of get a nice little rebuilt site already. It's got a few pages in it. Uh, what I did was I left those Razor pages in there and I added a new one for task, a little task manager. So in here, it just got a, a checkbox to say the task is complete and it's got the task name in it. And you can add a new task and it's got an add task button that adds it to the list. Since I've already got that running, we'll just open up the WinUI project. So the only thing in this UI is a WebView 2 control. And I've set the source to where my Blazor app is running up in Azure. And I don't think there's any code behind it. Nope. No code at all, it's all in Blazor. So let's run this one. So there it is. So the whole thing is just a web view control with the, the Blazor app running online. So this, the home, the counter, and the fetch data, these are all the pages you get out of the box when you open a new Blazor project. And then the tasks page, I added that. It's got no tasks in there now, but we can add buy milk. Walk dog. So adds those to the list, it keeps track of how many tasks are incomplete. So if I check one of these off, it updates to a one. And that's all running up in the web. And I think got the two. I think I bookmarked that page. Let's Maps. Yeah. So this is the blog post I mentioned. I'll put a link to this in my uh, my notes. But what this person did was they took the uh, the Blazor hybrid control from uh, .NET Maui and they got it to work in WinUI. And they also created um, a project template. So that you can just do file, new project, and get the uh, thing running out of the box. So deployment options. Uh, so WinUI has several packaging options. Um, there's framework dependent apps and self-contained apps. Um, so the difference between those is framework dependent means that your project is relying on the runtime for Windows App SDK being on the client machine, and it needs to have the, the minimum version that your app requires installed already. Uh, Self-contained apps is what it sounds like. The, the runtime is deployed along with your app, so it's part of the MSIX package. There's some pros and cons with each method. Um, Self-contained, you know, it's obviously going to be a larger installer if you're deploying the runtime, um, but you, it gives you complete control over that runtime version. But that control also means that you need to deploy updates to your app if you want to um, deploy any, uh, say there's a bug fix for Windows App SDK, you can't get that bug fix in their code to your app without another deployment. Uh, with framework dependent, that's the default option. It's a small installer, uh, but you're relying on the users or maybe their admins to keep um, 
the Windows App SDK updated with all the latest bug fixes and feature updates. Uh, as far as how you get your app to users, you have some different options. Uh, you can package and submit your app to the Microsoft Store. Uh, there's some documentation on submitting an app here. That's uh, pretty similar to how it worked with um, UWP apps or with other desktop apps. Um, any app that you can package as an MSIX, you can get up into the store. Uh, another option is the Windows Packet uh, Package Manager or Winget. Uh, I don't know if anybody here has used Chocolatey before, but it's a nice way to be able to, to script installs. Winget does the same kind of thing. You can use PowerShell scripts to uh, script an entire machine install of all your different Winget packages out there. Um, and there's some, actually, let me click on this documentation. Let's get some nice docs on how you would use it. That Winget configuration files that you use gives you some information on how you submit your your packages. So kind of at a high level, how you submit a package. There's a public uh, GitHub repository where all the manifest files, you could create a manifest file for your package. There's, there's an example on this page, what they look like. So you've got these different identifiers. You tell it what version, installer URL. So you would host your own installer somewhere out on the web that's publicly available. And then you have this manifest file on the Winget repository. So then when you're, when Winget calls your manifest, it'll go out and find your installer at that location, install it for the user. And I can quick do a, Winget command on here. You can see the, uh, all the available commands here. I do winget list. It'll show all the packages on my machine. And if there's a source repository available, it'll show that. So if it came from the winget repository, that'll be listed here. Scroll up to the top here. So the source. And it's also got this available column. So if there's a newer version available, you can see that here too. So right here, DuckDuckGo, I have that Windows browser installed for DuckDuckGo. Got a new version, so I can run, I think I did it here recently. We get upgrade DuckDuckGo. So right from the command line, it'll just start updating any of the packages that I call Winget update on or upgrade. Let's jump back to the slide while that's running. So other options, uh, there's side loading. It's not documented in the Windows docs, but in the .NET MAUI docs, there's some information about how you can uh, create a blank app project and a separate packaging project, and then do some side loading deployment where you don't have to go through the store, you don't need Winget, you can just um, install it directly for your users. Oops, there we go. And there's also ways that you can take a, an MSIX and get it to deploy with enterprise deployment tools, and there's, third-party installer options. Um, some of the more popular ones out there, I'm sure everyone's heard of Install Shield. They've been around forever. Um, Advanced Installer, they were one of the first ones to have an alternative uh, option for MSIX. Um, 
right. Now we're to the cross platform. We're going to take a look at uh, Uno platform project. I'm going to jump back into this dev folder. Um, I have the Uno project in the same repository with the other projects, but I also copied it down to my root because there are uh, past links, length issues with uh, the Android project that I'm hoping to be able to run here. So what I did in the book was I took my WinUI project, and I just pretty much copied and pasted all the code over into an Uno project. So I have the same view models, the same model data, I've got the same uh, views. So I've got the main page and the items details page. If we look at that here, it's the same thing. It's got the, the header template, the item template. It's got the controls at the top for the combo box and the button at the bottom for the add and delete buttons. And you can see here, it's giving me a little hint. I can uh, pre-launch the Windows subsystem for Android which unfortunately was just uh, announced that it's been deprecated. So I think in about a year, it will no longer be available, but uh, Windows has the subsystem for Android where you don't need to have an emulator. It just runs like the Windows subsystem for Linux. There's one for Android too, where it's, you can run apps directly and it looks like they're just running in Windows. You can, it's an Android app, but you can resize the window like you could with any other Windows app. The way that I usually get it primed is by launching the Amazon App Store, which is their Android App Store, and that automatically will launch the subsystem. And once you see that this is running, you can see this deprecation notice they just added next March. But if that's working, that means that Android is running on Windows. I think it may have just crashed Visual Studio. So advanced settings. This is where I can, you can verify that developer mode is on. This is what will make the subsystem for Android available to Visual Studio for debugging. while that launches. Let's just take a look at the Windows version of it. It should look just like our other Windows app. Any other questions so far while well, we're waiting for this to spin up? I don't see any at the moment.
So, yeah, all good there. Good. So, actually, in the book, the main changes I had to make when I moved all these classes from my WinUI project to the Uno project, I wouldn't have had to make it if I kept the project name the same. So, I named it Uno Media Collection just so I could tell them apart. But then I had to go through and change all the, the namespaces. So the only changes I had to make were just changing namespace names throughout the project. All right, so here it is. Looks all the same here running for Uno. So Uno is actually generating a WinUI project, so it should look exactly the same. So let's attempt fate here and try WebAssembly and see if we can get this to run in the browser. So with Uno, you can run on Windows, you can do uh, Mac, you can run on Linux, uh, you can run in the browser with WebAssembly, and of course, iOS and Android are both supported as well. So you get pretty much every platform. I've got the Uno website here. I think they have some yeah, this Uno Playground, you can play around with their controls in the browser, and this is actually launching Uno in WebAssembly. So you see your XAML on the left and how it renders on the right. change just the wasm and it regenerates and okay here comes our app Almost there. There we go, finally loaded. It has to load the entire .NET runtime and everything into the browser for us. So we get all the same functionality here in the browser. Try an item, big shark movie. That, that, that. So all the same functionality running in the web. Stop this, and we'll try the Android once again. Hopefully that'll work this time. Change this to mobile. Get the subsystem for Android selected, so we'll hit start.
on the deployment step, so we should almost be there. I was hoping it wouldn't take this long to compile. I ran these earlier today, thinking it would speed things up. All right, so now this minimizes Amazon window. So this is actually Android running. It looks like Windows, but this is Android. It behaves a little bit differently. You can see it's a little bit slower to click things. That big shark again. Oh, so the whole thing, the nice thing about using the subsystem for Android too is you can test all your different you know, layouts. You can just resize the window instead of having to have different emulators with different screen sizes. You can see how it'll look on kind of like a tablet form versus a phone form. Everything gets resized, your buttons move around how it would look on a phone. So that is Uno. And I think the next thing we'll look at is roadmap. What's coming up down the road? Uh, Windows app SDK 1.6 will be out later this year. Um, the big focus for this release is going to be quality. They want to address some of the, the top issues that have been filed, um, some issues with controls, others with the uh, installer being addressed. Uh, performance, we'll be getting some native uh, AOT support, C-sharp, uh, some general performance improvements, uh, some improved uh, dragging behavior for um, tabs, and some improvements with the uh, title bar. It can be a little bit tricky to, to set your, your title bar right now. Uh, some improvements with XBind and IntelliSense, and there's also some work that they'll be starting in 1.6, but it's not, it won't be released yet. Um, so it's a table view control that they're working on. Uh, the in-game controls, that's one of the things that's been missing uh, since they moved from UWP. Uh, there's no inking controls yet. And then doing some content islands that can go cross-process. And smooth app resizing is another thing, it's kind of smoothing out that experience. It'll be started in 1.6, but it won't be in a release to at least 1.7. Uh, you can view the roadmap for both WinUI 3 and Windows App SDK out on GitHub. Keep an eye on those for when they update them. And that's all I've got. Any questions or things you'd like to see more details on? Can I ask you a quick question about WPF? Yeah, for sure. Well, who, well, I say quick question, but you know, <laughs> what's the answer? Questions, answers are never quick, right? Right. Um, so for WPF, this is why I asked you for the for the demo in there because I wanted to look at how you did your table. I'm trying to do a data grid, mm -hmm. columns a button, and if I set the data grid up in a structure, uh -huh. it match because the last column's a button. <clears throat> not a bool or an int or a string or something like that. Right, so right. keep the items separate then instead of putting them in a structure. Can I just, I mean, the, the, the data grid, the user doesn't touch the data grid. It's only purely for looking at the data grid. It's it's a result of pressing some other button and we okay. put the data grid. <clears throat> hmm, that's a good question. Did you port my solution yet? I can take a look. I, I haven't that. had a chance to, no, because you, uh, I just saw the, uh, the update right before uh, the meeting, and I went and I just went and looked inside, and I saw that there was a WPF in there because <clears throat> it's WPF with MVVM is what I'm trying to uh, build it with. <clears throat> okay, let's see how I did this here. You weren't using a data grid, though. I don't think you were using a table. I think. <clears throat> let's see. 
Uh, this has got a data grid here. It is a data grid. Oh, it is a data grid. Like I, yeah. I have given you a chance to uh, go back and look at it. Yeah. So here I've got that style template with the data template. It's got the button. There's the there. delete button that's part of the data grid. Yeah, the last column. Interesting. Yeah, but this isn't doing MVVM here for the. It's not using a command. It's just going to the code behind for a quick event. But I don't right. see why why you couldn't just bind to a command there. That should work as well. Right. I just trying to populate the data grid, and I and, and of course uh, Visual Studio is saying no. There's an error here because the the structure that I have doesn't match the data grid <clears throat> because one column in the data grid it is a button. <clears throat> mm. So I'm thinking I should just do it separately. I should just do each column separately, each in, in each row separate. <clears throat> yeah, I would give that a try. Yeah, okay. I think that's probably the best. That if if I keep it all separate, then I don't have to worry about that last column. <clears throat> right. Yeah, all I have to sense. do is enable or disable the delete. <clears throat> okay. Yep. Thanks. Cool. No problem. And thanks for this for your time in 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 presenting this. It's greatly appreciated. <clears throat> oh yeah, no problem at all. Yeah, so the link I gave you will take you up to this last month. So it's got the two samples in there. It's got the the slides, and then the links. Markdown yep. file has all that stuff. And I've got the same thing for this month, and then all the different projects are up here. So, yeah, sure. worth a thousand words. <laughs> yes, yeah. I can put that in the chat right now too. Mm -hmm. Okay, Alvin, thank you. Really appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Thanks, guys. <clears throat>